Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our panel titled Geographers on the Russian Invasion, the geopolitics of the war in Ukraine. I would like to start by acknowledging the victims and devastating outcomes of all wars and organized violence. Today's war in Ukraine is one such tragic example among many others. I also would like to express solidarity with all anti-war efforts. So um, I am Mariana Pavlovska. I'm chair of the Department of Geography and Environmental Science at Hunter College and um, of the City University of New York. My research focuses on urban space and geographies of diverse economies and solidarity economies in the United States and Russia. Um, Peter Kabachnik, uh, my colleague with whom we organized and will moderate this panel, is professor of geography at the College of Staten Island, also part of CUNY. He studies geographies of authoritarianism and personality cults as political technologies of discipline and socio-spatial control. His other research has examined Georgian IDPs or internally displaced persons. I will introduce the panel and Peter will introduce the panelists and then we will proceed with the discussion. So um, as you know, this war started by, was started by Russia on February 24. The Russian state keeps calling it a special military operation. This implies a focused task, limited scope and short duration. But we are now into over a month of intense fighting with no end in sign and the threat of nuclear war as tangible as ruins of bombed Ukrainian cities. Ukraine has a large population of 45 million. Almost a quarter of this population including over half of all Ukrainian children, is displaced by military action. Thousands have died. So by now, this war is heavily covered by Western media and discussed by many scholars, observers, activists, and survivors. This, this particular panel stands out because we have gathered notable political geographers, scholars, who specifically study world regions, borders, national territories, and place, as well as processes that lead to their formation and contestation, as well as destruction. The study of geopolitics focuses on international aspects of those processes, while critical geopolitics considers human security in relation to security of the state. In addition to being political geographers, our panelists also have expertise in geopolitics of post-Soviet space. When we invited colleagues to participate, we asked them to share their thoughts along the line of four prompts. So here are the prompts. What is the most significant element of this conflict? What is the most overlooked aspect that you feel is not being discussed enough or at all? What can geographers in particular bring to this discussion? One year after, what will the region look like? We asked panelists to speak to two of the prompts for about five minutes. And we ask audience members to please submit questions through Q&A function of this webinar. We will take questions after all panelists finish their remarks. So before handing it over to Peter, I would like to express our thanks to those who help us organize this event. So we thank Hunter College and President Raab, as well as the leadership and fantastic support team of the Roosevelt House. The Department of Geography and Environmental Science at Hunter and the Department of Political Science and Global Affairs at College of Staten Island have sponsored this event. We also thank the panelists and we thank uh, the audience. Okay, now over to Peter. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Peter Kabachnik. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I want to echo Mariana's comments and just say that we have a great panel uh, for you. We have six amazing uh, geographers who will offer their insights on the war. It is my pleasure to introduce the panel, and I will introduce them in the same order that they will be speaking. First, we have Dr. Beth Michnik, Professor Emerita at the University of Arizona, who specializes in research on forced migration due to violent conflict. She has conducted extensive field research in Georgia about displaced people due to, due to the conflict in Abkhazia and the Russian invasion of South Ossetia, as well as in Ukraine after the Russian invasion in 2014. Up second, Dr. Jared Toll, who is a political geographer at Virginia Tech's campus in the greater Washington DC region. He is the author of many books, including Near Abroad, Putin, the West, and the contest over Ukraine and the Caucasus. Third is Dr. Shannon O'Lear, Professor of Geography in the Geography and Atmospheric Science Department and Director of the Environmental Studies Program at the University of Kansas. She has done work in the South Caucasus and her current work involves environmental geopolitics and slow violence. Next, we have Dr. John Biersack, who's an independent scholar and received his PhD in Geography from the University of Kansas. His work focuses on Ukraine, Russia, critical geopolitics, scale, borders, and the concept of Eurasia. Fifth is Dr. Jessica Graybill, who is an associate professor in the Russian and Eurasian Studies Program at Colgate University, researching energy and climate change-induced transformations of post-socialist, urban, and remote regions. She addresses the resilience of people and places, working with local communities in Russia and the Arctic, to imagine more sustainable futures. Finally, we close with Dr. Nathaniel Ray Pickett, who has a master's degree from the Center for Russian, Eastern European, and Eurasian Studies program at the University of Kansas, and just completed his PhD defense yesterday, so congratulations are in order, uh, in the Department of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences, also at KU. His most recent work is on the political geographies of post-Chernobyl Ukraine. Okay, so I want to thank and welcome our esteemed panelists, and let's get started. Our first speaker is Beth Michnik. So Beth, please take it away. Great. Thank you, Peter and Mariana. I really appreciate the invitation, and I will be brief. Um, two questions or two prompts that uh, Peter and Mariana asked us, one in particular, what's being overlooked? And one of the things that's being overlooked is the internal displacement. And just this week, I've started hearing news folks talking about the total displacement, internal versus refugees. So I just wanted to put this into a global perspective, and I have a couple of slides that I just want to share so that you can get a sense of what this looks like globally. So globally, there are usually more internally displaced from violent conflict than the externally displaced, than the people that have crossed an international border. And you can see this is from UNHCR, internally displaced is the green, the externally displaced is this darker blue. So this has been a regularity um, of these kinds of violent conflicts. The second thing I want to point out here is the massive, massive displacement problem that we have around the world due to violent conflict, 82.4 million in 2020. And so now, of course, there's likely to be more. But I'd like to just give you another graphical explanation of that. You can see this is a couple of years old, so it doesn't include the, the Ukrainians. 48 million internally displaced versus 21 million. And then you can see the countries that are the that have the most internally displaced. And right now, Ukraine in one month of conflict has a probably more than the entire internally displaced from the Syrian conflict. Um, these estimates have just been coming out. This one is 6.5. I've been seeing other ones as um, close to 13 million total displaced. And so that's something that we're not talking about enough. Now, I know that we're talking about refugees because it's emergent, it's on the border. It's really an important issue for all of Europe. 
But let's think about what it's going to be looking like inside Ukraine. And I and another colleague, Jane Zaviska, were there um, in 2015. So we saw what was going on with the internal displacement then. So one point I want to make is we have no idea what the internally displaced situation looks like, but we know it's at least 7 million right now. I am positive and probably significantly more. And they're trying to find housing and sustenance in a war-torn area that is trying to figure out how to distribute um, aid and housing to people. So internally, this is a huge issue. Usually the international organizations are right there. This time, it seems like it's been a little bit slow for lots of reasons, like 82 million other people who are displaced. The IOM, the International Organization for Migration, which is usually on the ground right away, is just starting to provide aid and is opening up a pilot location in Sarkapati to provide cash to the internally displaced because cash is the best way for them to find housing and to get food. And so cash is really, really critically important. The second point I wanna make is that there's a positive thing, as much as we can say positive, that there's already an internal infrastructure to provide aid. And when we were doing our field research, we'd say, okay, who was providing houses? And it was in 2014, 15, just like today, that it was the volunteeri. And we would be doing interviews and I'd say, can you explain what this volunteeri, you know, who is this? And so the same kind of process was working then. Cell phones, Facebook, that people themselves were providing the support for the IDPs and the refugees. And that's what's happening today. And there are many local NGOs and individuals who had that infrastructure in place and they've just ramped it up. I mean, I'm not minimizing it, it's huge. Um, but we should be really ready for a massive number of people who are internally displaced and almost invisible to the rest of the world, particularly right now. So the humanitarian situation throughout Ukraine is really severe. The final point that I wanna make is that um, part of a legacy of the first invasion was an understanding of the extreme impact of people losing their housing. That one of the features of um, privatization in Ukraine was that people got to keep their housing. And so their apartments or their houses became their assets. And there were many people who actually didn't want to leave the Donbass area because they didn't want to leave their financial assets. Now, all of us have seen the images across Ukraine of the housing that is being destroyed. So if you want to twist it a little bit and think about one year later, people's assets are gone not only the refugees, but the people who are remaining there. So these are some of the things that I wanted to bring up um, for later discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, our next speaker is Jared Toll. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter and Mariana for the invitation to speak. I have uh, got a, a timer here. So I'm going to move uh, very, very quickly. Um, what I want to talk about is the issue of the Donbass as a territorial conflict and what is coming, which is the question of uh, a potential referendum. The latest uh, uh, state of play in terms of the negotiations is that apparently the parties have agreed on four factors, but two are uh, so far intractable, and that is the status of Crimea and the status of the Donbass. You will remember from uh, 2014 that the annexation of Crimea was legitimized by a referendum, which was held in March uh, of 2014 with a very polarized uh, vision as to what the choices were. There was also a referendum uh, on the 11th of May 2014 in the Donbass, which was held by the two uh, people's republics that the separatists and the Russian forces stood up in that area. 
Um, and uh, that is part of the kind of general background to what I want to talk about, which is the Donbass conflict is at the center of this war. And it is one where effectively the Donbass was a territorial lever in which uh, uh, Russia could uh, move to a new policy of seeking to control Ukraine. And that was the reality from 2014 until February 2022, when the Minsk process was effectively abandoned by the Russian state. And you had the recognition of the DNR and the LNR, which was a prelude to launching the invasion. And then the subsequent, uh, what we've seen on our screens, the heroic uh, resistance to that, and then the unfolding of war crimes in Mariupol, which is part of the Donetsk. So what we have here is a very, very contrasting storylines. Uh, now, initially, the Russian storyline was uh, emphasizing genocide and the need to rescue uh, the Russian population in the Donbass and from Ukrainian fascists, you know the whole story. But Ukraine now is using that particular uh, storyline based on empirical evidence of what is unfolding in Mariupol. There's been a massive population displacement in these areas, uh, an estimated, uh, you know, it may be now well below 50%, maybe 40% of the population relative to 2014. Now, in our research, uh, my colleagues and I uh, did public opinion polling in both the government controlled Donbass, which includes Mariupol, and then the uh, non government controlled areas. And to cut a long story short, since my time is running very, very uh, 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 out very quickly, um, it really matters who's doing the polling. And in this particular case, the best you can do in a conflict situation is CATI polling, which is computer aided telephone surveys. And where the survey comes from matters a great deal in the results that you get. Uh, and the particular survey company that we used uh, in both the government and non-government controlled areas was the Kiev International Institute of Sociology. You see the results here in the non-government controlled areas where there's overwhelming uh, support for staying within Ukraine. But look at the uh, results uh, uh, in the non-government controlled areas and contrast them to those from Levada. What does this mean? There's massive difficulties with any kind of proposed referendum on the Donbass. Uh, the referenda in the past have tend to be simulations of the people, ways to legitimate territorial control uh, by Russia. Um, so there's a, a series of questions that remain uh, unanswered in terms of the possibility of holding uh, a referendum in these areas. The timing, it matters hugely whether this is done quickly or whether uh, the time is taken on this. What options are allowed? Whether the option of independence, which has very little support in public opinion polling, is the only one that is available, or whether remaining in Ukraine or joining Russia are options. Who is counted? Are the displaced going to be counted or not? Because they're part of the uh, residents of Donbass. They were in 2014. What particular debate is permitted and who controls that debate? Who runs the referendum? Is this something that is going to be legitimated by the United Nations, by the OSCE? And then will the outcome be seen as legitimate because a part of the incentive for Russia here to hold a legitimate referendum is the possibility that sanctions would be lifted uh, if this is done in a way which meets international standards. And right now, the prospect of that is, is really quite limited. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jared. Our next speaker is uh, Shannon O'Lear. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. There's a really good turnout. This is clearly a really important topic. Uh, it's in the news a lot, but I appreciate everybody taking the time to be here. Um, I think we can all expand our understanding of what's happening um, in Ukraine. And the prompt that I suppose my comments address um, most directly is the one about what can geographers in particular bring to this discussion. 
And to bring us back to our roots, I feel that geographers can really bring some boots on the ground familiarity with places, with the people in these places, with cultures of these places, languages, literatures uh, of these places to really understand um, not just at the kind of the state level politics, which I will talk about a little bit, but also as, as Beth was talking about how these social networks emerge uh, to, to help support people um, in un, not necessarily predictable ways. Um, and I'm also, the, the other point I would talk about is human environment interactions. And this conflict as we're seeing is having all kinds of ripple or spiral effects for uh, environmental, um, with environmental and resource implications all over the place. And of course, those are bound to be misunderstood and misinterpreted. So it's, it's good to have a, a clear understanding of, of those. So um, as Peter introduced me, I have done uh, a lot of work in Azerbaijan, a little bit in Armenia, uh, and very little in Georgia. Um, but South Caucasus is where I've, I've spent most of my field work time. And it's interesting from, from this side, since I haven't been in the field recently, it is interesting to see even how Russia's invasion of Ukraine is having ripple effects um, with Azerbaijan and Armenia and they, uh, the tensions over the Karabakh region, which you may recall, uh, they established a peace, trilateral peace agreement in November of 2020 with Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Russia. Um, so recently, just a couple of bits and pieces, uh, you have like Russia's Ministry of Defense has made statements about the shipment of humanitarian aid to Ukrainian regions through Nagorno-Karabakh, which is not the way it's territory in Azerbaijan, but it's that is how Armenians label it. So Russia is not making uh, Azerbaijan very happy right now. Um, and it's so this is like a small indicator that the that, that ties between those states are kind of fraying. Uh, or at least it's it's weakening Russia's um, ties with Azerbaijan. And there's also been claims that Armenia is misusing the Lachian Corridor, which is the connection between the Karabakh region and our Azerbaijan with Armenia uh, for military rather than the intended humanitarian purposes. Um, and they're also concerned that the Russian peacekeepers in the region are not getting the job done and there have been flare ups of, of the conflict there. Also, interestingly, um, these tensions could lead these countries to seek ties elsewhere. For instance, Azerbaijan is strengthening its relations with Turkey, which is a member of NATO. So that's worth paying attention to. Um, Armenia, for its part, has, is trying to play a neutral role of sorts, keeping in mind that they've had close ties with Russia and the Russian military for a long time. Um, their nuclear plant there was supplied by Russia and supported by Russia. But Armenia has not recognized the Donetsk People's Republic, I'm putting that in air quotes, uh, or the Luhansk People's Republic. It's not recognized the independence of those places as Russia would prefer that it do. Um, but it also has not condemned Russia's actions. And so you can read in the news the back and forth that, uh, you know, how Armenia has actually abstained from a lot of votes in international venues um, to try to walk a very careful line, doesn't want to irritate Russia, still needs Russia's help. But is not really playing along with Russia though, the way that Russia might like. So again, those things are worth watching. And of course in Georgia, they're watching what is playing out in Ukraine um, with a lot of compassion and familiarity because a lot of what is happening is very similar to what happened in Georgian uh, areas back in 2008 when Russia made similar claims about the reasons for invading uh, in Georgia. So uh, I think it's worth watching how the uh, South Caucasus is, is a microcosm of different ways that the tensions could play out um, with what Russia is doing in Ukraine. So, and those are all state level observations, which is really only one level of interest. And it's of course only when you get to these places and ask people, uh, talk to people about what their day-to-day -day experiences are that you would really have a much more interesting story and a more full picture of, of what's happening. Um, and then my other point is about the environmental aspects, and we've probably all heard a lot about these in the news, but when you start compiling them, it's, it's really quite, um, it can be overwhelming, uh, the things that are happening. I know there's been a lot of attention on the nuclear facilities and what that could mean, and I have a feeling there will be another panelist who will be speaking to those issues, so I'm not going to say much there. Um, 
also, interestingly, I did notice in The Economist of all places, they had a piece on the, um, the environmental zone around Chernobyl, where they've actually been doing a lot of biological research about how uh, different species of birds and other animals have been adapting to the, the radiation fallout there. And of course, now that research area is um, not actually operational. Uh, due to the war. Um, there have been concerns about influencing water supplies in Ukraine, and a map that I saw in the news uh, is sort of troubling. So it's sort of a choropleth map, your basic choropleth map, choropleth map of here's all the water conflicts in the last, you know, however many years. And this is where geographers, we, we really need to step in and say, yes, but what do we mean by water conflict? Is water really motivating it? Is it sort of the being affected by a conflict, like what is the role of water in a conflict? Just putting them in the same sentence doesn't mean that we understand the processes of, of what's happening there. So how we put these things together matters. Um, there are a lot of food security concerns. We've all heard that with sanctions uh, and also with Ukraine unable to do its farming now, uh, there will be, um, there are concerns about food supplies. This is particularly true for a lot of African states. Uh, Benin, Sudan, Egypt, for instance, get 70% of their wheat supply from Russia, which that is now uh, jeopardized. And so there are concerns about food security. Um, and of course, we've also heard about gas supplies as European countries are trying to find other suppliers than Russia, uh, who's going to supply that liquid natural gas. The US is trying to ramp up production, but our specialty is sweet crude, uh, which is only refined in some places and it's not the sour crude and it's certainly not the natural gas. So there's all these questions about what, how those gas supplies may be um, resupplied or re found in other places other than Russia. So again, having some sensitivity about the nuances of how resources are used, how they are processed, where they are, how they are networked or not networked. These are other important questions that um, I think geographers can speak to. And just looking at the, the list of attendees here today, I think there are also a lot of people here. I look forward to your questions and your comments because I think there's also a lot of expertise in the audience. So with that, I will, um, I will stop and I'll allow the conversation to continue. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Shannon. Our next speaker is John Biersack. Thank you, Peter and Mariano. Uh, pleasure to be here and uh, very, very privileged to be uh, with these panelists. Uh, kind of jumping off from uh, what uh, Dr. O'Lear spoke about with what geographers can contribute, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit to uh, related to that and um, what uh, Professor Toll uh, spoke about with geopolitical storylines and. Um, geographers can absolutely unpack a lot of these um, these spatial narratives and um, geopolitical narratives that involve a conflict in Ukraine. And so kind of going back to the, the practical um, and a geopolitical discourse of a lot of Putin's recent speeches questioning the sovereignty of Ukraine um, and its modern creation as uh, a product of, of the Soviet Union or Soviet Russia, as he called it. Uh, this really um, kind of brings to the fore the, the idea of who Ukrainians are today um, in the post Euromaidan era and thinking about the, our, the coverage that we see in the West, how, um, but also how Ukrainians represent themselves um, in various media formats as a united Ukraine or Ukraine versus Russians. And one of the things that um, geographers can bring to this, of course, adding to what everyone else has said, it would be um, unpacking the, the political geography uh, within Ukraine itself and thinking about um, the growth of civic Ukrainian identity in the post-independence era from the early 1990s on. And, given reports that we've seen of uh, Ukraine uh, appeals from Russian forces for Ukrainian um, military uh, to potentially switch sides or calling on them to surrender or trying to uh, set up uh, friendly or collaborationist um, kind of civil administrations in some of these cities that have met very um, uh, flat results. Uh, we we see kind of this uh, 
that Russia is, is advancing these storylines, but it's not congruent with what we've seen so far with um, who Ukrainians are. And um, this kind of feeds into ideas of kind of the simplified Ukrainian um, political geography or linguistic geography even of say east-west Ukraine where the further east you go you might find more Russian speakers or more pro-Russian Ukrainians uh, etc and so that is um, I think um, vastly oversimplifying the nuances that we see within Ukraine um, and given qualitative and quantitative data that we, over the last uh, 30 years, it, it just doesn't seem to bear um, with, with reality. Uh, so, for example, um, you would have uh, the, um, the, the basically large urban rural divides as well. Um, you would have uh, Russophone Ukrainians who were very patriotic. I mean, you can see this in um, some of the makeup of, um, say, Ukrainian armed forces or uh, paramilitary units in from 2014 on. But also, you see this um, lack of, well, I'd say, complication of uh, kind of ident identities with both local, regional, and state um, that doesn't really speak to. Kind of these oversimplifications that um, a lot of um, the coverage of Ukraine or uh, geopolitical actors would be proffering. And so I think uh, Ukrainians can, um, in seeing kind of these geopolitical discourses and the proliferation of social media, et cetera, you have a lot of blending of kind of the various registers of geopolitical discourses that um, political geographers can definitely um, unpack or research um, especially with um, kind of user-generated uh, media as well. And thinking about, say, um, President Zelensky's various, um, various Twitter addresses or that are then you know, proliferated in the West or, or uh, disseminated within Ukraine itself and thinking about um, kind of how um, geographers can unpack these narratives and the blending of um, these various storylines um, in thinking about um, relations of space and power. And so uh, thank you for the time and uh, I will let the conversation continue as well. Thank you, John. Our next speaker is Jessica Graybill. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mariana. I'd like to discuss a geographic and linguistic concept that helps ground an understanding of this war. The concept of Dirjava, of great power, extends several centuries back into the Russian Empire. It invokes control and management over colonized populations, economies, and resource flows by a strong state. Dirjava continued to be a foundational idea about the place of Russia in the world order throughout the Soviet period. Now, 30 years into the post-Soviet period, period, we see it rising again in a newly horrific shape in Putin's current Russia. The root word of great power in Russian is derzat, which means to hold, keep, or possess. This is quite different from our English word for power, where we understand the French roots of the concept to be about ability and potency. With this linguistic comparison, to possess, in contrast to be potent, we may better understand that the concept of power in Russia is about the desire to hold territory, people, and resources at grand scales. Derzhava is understood by Ukrainians very well, both because of the common Slavic root of the Ukrainian and Russian languages, and because the territory that is today Ukraine has been desired and possessed by the Russian Empire for centuries and by the Soviet Union in the 20th century. Why express and enact Derzhava over Ukraine? Why right now? Scholars have pointed to Putin's desire for legacy especially the spatial legacy of drawing together as many parts of the former Soviet Union as possible, whether economically in the Eurasian Economic Union or ethno-nationalistically by reclaiming linguistic or ethnic cultural ties. Putin's drive for spatial legacy can be understood when examining maps from about 150 years ago, where we would find two regions in present day Eastern Ukraine, Little Russia and New Russia. New Russia, 
a region named in the 18th century, contains multiple nationalities, languages, and religions, many of whom assimilated or left, assimilated into the Russian Empire or left the region, and then assimilated into the Ukrainian Soviet Republic for those who stayed. The term largely got lost in the Soviet Union, lost importance until 2014, when Putin revived the concept of New Russia, Novorossiya, in a new political project, saying that the territories of Kharkiv, Luhansk, Donetsk, Kherson, Mykolaiv, and Odessa were part of this new territorial confederation. You all in the audience recognize these place names to be those of the urban regions heavily under siege right now. Little Russia, coined in the 14th century, originally indicated the eastern lands of Rus, the precursor to Russia, the Russian Empire, all of which is in today's Ukraine. Little or lesser Russia is an outdated term that conveys an imperialistic view of territory, but especially of Ukrainians as little Russians who belong to Russia. I say that in quotes, certainly. Ukrainians today find this usage belittling, yet it is still used in Russian nationalist discourse to present Ukrainians and Russians as a single people united by the Russian nation. Putin wrote about this last July in his essay titled On the Historic Unity of Russians and Ukrainians. I hope that these examples show that the issue of identity is front and center here for both Russians and Ukrainians. For Putin and Putin's Russians, identity has become framed as about language, culture, and the very blood running through a Slavic territorial heartland. For Ukraine, identity was historically multi-ethnic, multilinguistic, and multi-confessional, and it remains so today. It is useful to consider identity in Ukraine as civic identity, where Ukraine is currently fighting a civil war for the right to control and define Ukrainian identity as it relates to civic life. Understanding the linguistic and spatial roots of Russia's concept of Derzhava helps us understand why Ukraine, why now? I'd like to add energy to this concept to discuss the idea of an energy superpower, an energeticzkaya sphere Derzhava, to see how Russian ideas about power and control over urban space, largely right now, are creating horrific urban warfare and potentially even more horrific energy consequences. During the Soviet period, heavy industry, power plants, chemical refining factories, military industry was located in cities. Pipeline or rail infrastructure brought in hydrocarbon fuel for their activities in a node and network system, emplacing power hungry cities and factories across the Eurasian landscape, not just the Ukrainian one. Power plants, including nuclear power plants, were built inside or on the edges of cities. This energy landscape helped the Soviet Union and now Russia to, to maintain um, or, to have, or to maintain the desire to be an energy superpower. Now in the Putin era, being an energy superpower has largely been about hydrocarbon extraction and export and not about its nuclear power capabilities. But I'd like to turn attention here to how Soviet infrastructure and urban planning that still exists largely in place on the ground today is related to nuclear power in Ukraine and may broaden the concept of Russia as an energy superpower. Ukraine has four active uh, nuclear power plants and one decommissioned plant. Russia currently controls six reactors at one plant, Zaporizhia, and the decommissioned reactors at the Chernobyl plant. Russia's desire to control these power sources ostensibly has been to gain control over power sources to cities and the rail and road infrastructure that feeds the power plants. However, control over these sites for the production of nuclear energy may bring us to an even more terrifying understanding of the meaning of being an energy superpower. Should control by the Russian military be inadequate or should a protracted war turn Putin's attention to the possibility of unconventional chemical or nuclear warfare? These are just a few linguistic, conceptual and spatial concepts that I draw on to unravel the twisted logic of Russia's war on sovereign Ukraine. The concept of Dirjava, great power, combined with the hunger for energy dominance in perhaps whatever way possible, is at the forefront of my mind and feeds my concern for people in Ukraine, first and foremost, but for also any peaceful coexistence regionally and globally. To conclude, in addition to my eye on actual territories, 
and hopefully back on the ground in them as soon as possible, as, as uh, Dr. Arlier has mentioned. I will keep watching and listening to the development of affect and emotions from within Russia and other post-Soviet places about Derzhava. I will be watching and listening for emotions about Russia as an increasingly authoritarian state. Why? The more we can understand how emotions and affect are culturally scripted by the state and how that scripting affects people in their everyday lives, the more we can understand how state emotion and acquiescence to or resistance to it is shaping Putin's horrific, but perhaps final grab for power. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our, our final speaker is uh, Nathan Pickett. Yeah, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to be on the panel and to everyone else who's already spoken. I feel like the blessing and the curse of going last is that a lot of <laughs> the points I are, am going to make are, are just echoes of what um, everyone else has been talking about. But I kind of wanted to, I guess, center my comments around a couple points. One about timing and another about framing and context. So we are now sitting 31 days after the invasion began on February 24th. And if we were to have this panel and ask the same questions, even two weeks ago, I imagine that a lot of our comments might be colored a little differently, especially when we're considering um, Western response and media coverage and trying to understand, even have a fuller idea of what's going on on the ground, whether that's having accurate or semi-reliable numbers of displaced people, as Beth mentioned, or in terms of the, the energy infrastructure like Jessica was talking about. So having this period of time being a month after, we have a little bit more information and a little bit more time for some of these narratives and narrative structures to sort of sink in and settle and, and coalesce around um, a few part particular different thrusts. Um, and to that end, as someone who is living in the United States at the moment, um, looking at the coverage here in our local media talking about this invasion and war going on, um, one of the trends that I noticed was that from the beginning, Ukrainian agency was almost absent from the situation. There was a whole lot of talk about uh, this is a conflict between Russia and the West and Ukraine has just happened to be caught in the middle. One of these grand geopolitical narratives of Ukraine as a buffer state, whose sphere of influence does Ukraine belong to as if Ukrainians were just a, an afterthought and weren't the, the, the core piece of what this conflict is, is about. Um, and Ukrainian identity, as, as has been mentioned by uh, numerous people on the panel already. And I think now, especially I've noticed in the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot more attention paid to Ukrainian agency and Ukrainian identity and the acts of Ukrainians both on the ground, whether that's in terms of, of their resistance efforts um, and the cultural saliency. I mean, people really like to to find heroes, right, that they can glom onto. And, you know, whether they're more mythological creations like the ghost of Kiev that was popular two weeks ago, but even now talking about that seems outdated, right? Because of the speed that this conflict is, is moving. Um, and, and I think the role too of social media in the quick dissemination of what is happening is something that is used to varying degrees of success and for a variety of um, propaganda and informational efforts, right? On social media, you're gonna be able to find any particular anecdote or example to back up virtually any political agenda that you want. Um, and so as someone who subscribes to a lot of like on Telegram, different channels and stuff where Ukrainians are posting photos and videos and stories, and you know the, people can react to them and there's comments, looking at how that situation is unfolding in a Ukrainian language space that's largely occupied by Ukrainians interacting with a Ukrainian controlled service of within Telegram, which was developed by a Russian and is very popular in that area of the world, um, has been really interesting to watch in comparison to the coverage or sometimes lack of coverage of what is happening in Ukraine at the moment. So I think that this framing element and the use of media to advance particular narratives, um, you know, the the at the beginning talking about NATO a lot to now 
the, the, the NATO part of the discussion seems to be like on a roller coaster ride down in importance sometimes. I mean, some people think it's the most important thing. Other people have completely stopped talking about NATO. Um, whereas the, the, the increase of whether that's televised addresses by Zelensky being subtitled in English and shown on national cable news, um, or Zelensky, like he did last night, speaking directly in English to Western audiences as an appeal for aid um, to some of the more like on the ground, like Instagram and TikTok and Twitter posts of Ukrainians explaining what's going on as they're seeing things unfold. I think finding how those stories and elements are relevant to the broader context is something that when we're talking about networked geographies of how people are communicating with each other, the limits on those communications, who controls the, the, the levers of media and what stories become salient, what gets turned into a meme. I think that is, is part of the story as well and, and how the information is being molded and processed and presented to varying audiences. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess that's the main point that hasn't been talked about yet that I wanted to bring up. Um, and then, and then I'd like to thank the other panelists at this point so far for, for your insights and, um, and I'm looking forward to the discussion from the audience as well. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Nathan. And uh, thank you to everyone, all the pan panelists, for your very thoughtful and insightful comments. Uh, so now we open it up uh, for discussion. Um, we want to welcome the panelists to, to uh, piggyback off of comments, uh, other panelists uh, and points that they made. And we also uh, want, want to uh, welcome the audience to start using the Q&A uh, uh, button and put your, your questions in. And we'll, uh, we'll uh, Mariana and I will uh, ask them to the panelists. Um, so should we get started with that, Mariana? Yeah, sure. Um, we have three questions right now. And um, before um, we proceed, I would like also to thank all panelists for extremely rich and textured and insightful and non-repetitive assessment of what is going on. So I think it's really very, very powerful um, showcase of geographic insight into those events. Um, so uh, Peter, I'm just gonna start with the first question. And unfortunately I can see somehow on my computer it doesn't show the full name. So um, I'm gonna just read the first name of the person who asked it. So the first question is from Christine. And um, I would like to direct this question to Jessica. And the question is, to what extent is the US position on, quote, helping win the EU of Russian oil, unquote, code for, quote, let's develop and sell more of our climate damaging indigenous land taking dirty oil as soon as possible, unquote. Thanks, Mariana. <laughs> yeah, this is a uh, this is of course in our minds, right? And also, what's on what should be in, or is in our news and in, in our minds? How does this mean a return or a greater turn, perhaps, to Middle Eastern oil as well, at least in the short run? Um, so I'm I'm not going to talk about the Middle East in terms of oil. I'll stick to this question here for thinking about um, developing more of our own oil resources, um, be that fracking. Um, in various parts of the United States or thinking about Alaskan oil here largely, perhaps some other places as well. Um, I think that it's too early to know in many ways exactly what this will bring. Um, I'm in touch, so I work in the Arctic, so this, the, the, um, in the Russian Arctic particularly. And so the shutting down of Nord Stream 2 has been a shock, right, to just about everyone for thinking about what this will mean. And I use that, and I'll come back to talk about the US in just a second. I use thinking about Nord Stream 2 to think about what that has meant to some, uh, to a country like Norway, right? All of a sudden, Norway's going, oh, Oh, well, we'll be, we'll be, you know, back to exp exploring and uh, uh, taking out more of our own raw resources, right, instead of relying on Russia's to maybe fill some of those pipelines coming from the Arctic region down into Europe. Now, that's again a mixed bag, right, maybe good for the Norwegian economy um, and people who think that oil out of the Arctic is a good thing in that sense, um, but more difficult in terms of climate damaging indigenous land 
taking and oceanic taking of those oil and gas resources. So we could think about those same kinds of things certainly on our own landscape. Um, does this mean that other places like Anwar may open back up in Alaska? Sure, everything's on the table when these kinds of things happen. Does it mean that we need to be really careful in understanding what that will look like across the US in terms of our own land energy landscapes? Yes. Thank you, Jessica. Um, that was very um, uh, right to the point. Um, I just want to advance one hope, maybe something uh, relatively good that could come out of that horrifying situation is that in general, our dependence on uh, carbon is going to decrease as a result and people will be more actively seeking for alternative sources. Yeah, go ahead. I absolutely agree with that. I can't think that that's anything but good, but the things we will need to watch, and The Economist just had a good piece on this as well, is the so-called so green minerals. What will this mean for all of the minerals, cobalt, nickel, et cetera, that are mined in multiple places in terms of resource curse and extraction around a new set of things, not new minerals to us, certainly, but a new set of things to fuel us, literally. Absolutely. Thank you. Peter, do you want to continue with the question? Yeah, we have another question from Karari Tirada. Um, is there any information on how this war is influencing Putin's popularity within Russia and Ukraine? Uh, Jared, maybe you have some data from your recent polling or anybody else want to speak to this? Um, yeah, so there are polls uh, that are conducted in, in Russia, but, um, you know, it's, um, it, polls are not going to necessarily be very reliable uh, in wartime. There is a rally around the flag effect. Uh, a number of these polls that I have seen uh, are by uh, pollsters uh, that are uh, at least influenced by the Kremlin or Kremlin friendly. Uh, and so we just have to weigh it uh, and see how this unfolds. But uh, the early evidence is that um, the war uh, has majority support, a uh, just majority support within Russia. That's understandable. The information environment there, uh, which is predominantly television, for the older generation is completely controlled by the state. So uh, the idea of sort of state patriotic performances and uh, the sort of state cultivation of state emotion around the war, we have to assume that that's successful. And, and that's uh, one of the things that as, as political geographers, we, we need to be aware of. Uh, we should not uh, fall into the assumption that the way we see the world is the way others see the world. We have our own storylines. We are in our own information bubble to a certain extent. And one of our challenges as researchers is to uh, push beyond that uh, and try to understand the particular uh, worldview of others and, and also understand the power relationships that are involved when you have geopolitics and control of information. Thank you. Um, and just to piggyback off of that, uh, while Putin's uh, high levels of support and opinion polls are certainly inflated, they're not completely fabricated. There is a sizable portion of people in Russia who support Putin. Um, but that being said, there's also many different reasons to support somebody. You can really find him a great politician. You can find be attractive to the masculinist aspect of his leadership. You can just want stability. And, you know, so there's very many different reasons why that portion of, of Russians would be so would be supportive of him. Um, okay, next question um, but from Stuart Kaplan. Uh, is there any religious conflict within Ukraine that facilitates Russia's view of Ukraine as part of Russia? And similarly, is there a religious component to the current conflict between Ukraine and Russia? John, do you want to talk to about it? Uh, sure, just one sec. So um, I, I would say there, I don't know if I'd call it a conflict, but uh, there is a, um, 
tensions between Ukrainians who um, subscribe to the Russian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate and then the um, Ukrainian uh, Uniat uh, Church. And there have been um, uh, parishes have, uh, or one thing Ukraine sought for a long time to get their um, patriarchate uh, recognized. And um, I believe it is, uh, or was in the post 2014 era, um, someone could please correct me on that. And um, you're seeing that um, there are um, in areas occupied by, uh, by either in Crimea or in uh, the, the uh, Donbass area, you're, you've, I mean, there are a lot of reports of um, basically religious uh, repression there against um, Protestant groupings or seizures of um, of, of union or Greek Catholic churches and um, th and things like that. But I don't know, um, I mean, I, I would see this as kind of another uh, aspect of kind of this idea of great Russian identity or civilizational um, kind of narratives or an aspect to that. Yeah, could, could I ad address that? Because I think there's one of the ironies of the current moment is the way in which the very ambitious nature of the Russian project, Putin's project in, uh, in Ukraine recalls Novorossiya. Novorossiya uh, is uh, an imperialist project that was associated with a particular branch of orthodoxy, uh, particularly the orthodox oligarch Malafiev. Uh, and so you do have this vision of Orthodox priests blessing Russian soldiers going into battle. But a number of the Russian soldiers are actually from the North Caucasus. They're from Dagestan, uh, as well as from, uh, as we know famously from Chechnya. Uh, and so they are suffering quite uh, high levels of casualties. They're Muslims. And so you have this irony of a particular geopolitical vision driven by orthodox understandings of uh, a, a Tsarist understandings of, of, uh, of Ukraine, but being fueled in part by um, the fact that Russia is a multi-ethnic state and that demographically there is a concentration of poor young men in the North Caucasus who've been uh, funneled into the Russian uh, the military. And then there's the talk about taking fighters from Syria, which is sort of underscores the, um, the difficulties that the Russian military have in terms of uh, manpower. Uh, so I think there's all sorts of ironies involved in it uh, that are worth kind of uh, paying attention to. Okay, anyone else wants to add to that? No. Mariana, I would just note that that actually overlaps a little bit with a question further down in the in the Q&A that we, we might just throw in there now. And this is from Catherine Vigalis as um, a narrative missing in mainstream mm -hmm. Western media. Can anybody speak to the aspect of Russian imperialism as a motivation for invasion? Right, and we also have another question about Ukrainian identity. So those two kind of speak to each other. So if you want, if everyone wants to elaborate more, I think Jessica kind of touched very, very heavily on that already. So if others would like to add to that, it would be great. Nathan? Go ahead, Nathan. <clears throat> sure. So one of the things too, especially when we're talking about like Western portrayals of the war and in of Ukraine generally over the past 30 years, or the lack thereof. Um, one of the things that kind of struck me in particular, in terms of how this particular war is being framed, to me, again, speaking like as a geographer with, the, with you know, a lot of experience and language skills in the region, and, you know, I lived in Ukraine for three years. This is a, to me, and, and again, I, I don't remember who, I think it was Jared who mentioned it before, like, as geographers, we see the world in a particular way. We can't really expect anyone else to think, you know, the same ways that we do, given the experiences and the expertise that we have. But for me, this is one of these instances where 
this is clearly a war of imperial aggression against a former colony who has made a series of moves over the past 30 years to pull itself further and further out of the Russian sphere of influence, which is just a fancy word for imperialism and colonialism. So as Ukraine is evolving ideas of what Ukraine is, who Ukrainians are, what Ukrainianness is, that coalescence around a, a specific set of ideas and civic nationalism and this sort of multi-ethnicity, multilinguistic, multi-confessional idea of what Ukraine is um, between the referendum for independence in the 90s to the Orange Revolution to Maidan and now everything since 2014, there's been this, this sort of idea where the colony is, is getting further and further away and we, Russia as the imperial power, must step in to reassert control. And this goes back to what uh, Jessica was saying about Derjava, um, this idea that, and, and even the, the, the old idea that without Ukraine, there is no Russian empire, right? And so I think that this is a narrative that isn't really picked up so much in, especially in Western media, at least not that I've seen, um, but I think that really does help explain a lot of the motivations and ideas and, and what the purpose of the war is and helping cut through some of the signal versus noise, especially when it comes to official state responses that are parroted around in media or different propaganda effects or efforts. Thanks, Mason. Beth, did you want to add something to it? <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to add two points and to underscore, as Nathan did, Jessica's comment about civic identity and what's going on in Ukraine, that people were surprised that the Ukrainians would pick up arms. Um, having been there at that time of the first invasion, I wasn't surprised because of that civic identity and this huge social movement of voluntary, which was said very clearly in Russian. And that's an important point to remember as well. The second point I wanted to add is that we shouldn't forget that there's been a long history in the Soviet period of internal, um, at the internal audience is a very important part of foreign policy. And Lori Salatin traced this with the immigration movement out of the Soviet Union um, a long time ago. And I'd say that we really do want to recall the Russian population as part of Putin's target here. Um, and so it may be a way to gain support that he feels that he may not be gaining or to underscore something that's going on domestically. Thank you so much. Um, and just with regard to that, um, I, I want to draw attention that um, the cities uh, that already kind of was noted here, that majority of cities that were a bomb right now, they are Russian speaking cities. So, and um, I don't know, to a Russian person, just seeing that is really um, very traumatizing. And um, I remember watching a clip uh, where the mayor of Kharkiv, which is this one of the first um, assaulted cities, was talking to um, people of Kharkiv and uh, calling them to stand up to the aggressor. The language, he was speaking in Russian to them, right? So he was speaking in Russian to them and the language he was using could be verbatim taken from World War II movies when cities, Russian cities were standing up to uh, Nazi aggression. And just to understand that in this case, the same words are directed to a Russian army is, is really um, overwhelming. So just wanted to add to the complexity of what is going on. It's not Russian Ukraine. Okay. Peter, do you want to take a um, new question? Sure, uh, and I think this one is a good follow to this discussion. Andrew White has a question. How has Ukrainian national identity changed since 2014 and how is it affecting their response to the invasion? So I think we can uh, continue this discussion with that theme. 
Anybody want to take a stab at it? Beth? Sure, I'd just like to underscore that there is a very strong national identity, which as other people have said, it's a multinational identity. And I think that is one of the things that is most misunderstood, both in Russia and here, that Ukraine sees itself, and I heard this over and over again, this is a multinational country. And the speaking of Russian, I mean, when we did um, focus groups in Ukraine with the IDPs, they Russian, Russian, Ukrainian, just no English. And so the language wasn't the issue, unlike where we were doing field research in Georgia after the Russian invasion. And I started to learn Georgian after that because a lot of people just said, I'm not speaking Russian, even though I fully understand it. So this isn't a language issue. This, you know, the civic identity, it's Ukrainian identity. Yeah, and as uh, um, I think Jared mentioned, you know, or, you know, starting a war is a way, uh, and as Beth mentioned, it's a form of domestic uh, politics, right? Uh, and, it, and you can, it's an easy way to get a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people energized and patriotic. Defending your country is also a way <laughs> to, uh, generate national, national identity. Um, and this is, I think, another one of these ironies that, um, if there was a, a certain fractures in Ukrainian national identity in different regions, a lot of that <laughs> has probably been cemented together, uh, and probably for a long time, uh, Jared? Yeah, um, let me dissent a little bit. Um, I think the language politics in Ukraine uh, is, um, you know, it is a subject of considerable um, attention uh, on the part of uh, those that uh, privilege want to kind of institutionalize the privileging of the speaking of Ukrainian over Russian. Uh, and so uh, the language laws that were passed, the decommunization laws uh, were contentious. And one of the reasons Poroshenko lost on a very ethno-nationalist uh, platform was because of a backlash against that. So, um, there, there, Ukraine in since 2014 did tilt towards ethno, uh, sort of ethno nationalist vision, um, centered on Western Ukraine. And uh, while that was not necessarily the particular dominant practice in, in, the, in the center of Ukraine, and my understanding in Kiev and elsewhere, um, we have to understand that uh, there is still a struggle going on between a more inclusive uh, notion of Ukrainian identity and a much more exclusive one. And so therefore this became raw material for, uh, for the Russian state. Uh, and of course, it was exaggerated and it was uh, weaponized in a way that was sort of vicious. Uh, but, you know, I, I saw it with my own eyes. I went to the Victory, uh, Victory Day parade in Kiev in 2019, and there were uh, a, a bunch of uh, supporters of Bandera and others shouting uh, at the veterans uh, from World War II, shouting, you know, Bandera he fought for Ukraine and he won. Uh, and that is that is something you would not see in the United States where veterans are revered, especially veterans of the Great Patriotic War, World War II. Um, you know, that uh, give me an insight into the raw nature of uh, the decommunization debate within Ukraine. So I think we, it's a complex country, it's a heterogeneous country, and while there is a, a certainly um, unity right now, and there is a clear aggressor here, we also should realize that as geographers that uh, this moment will pass and the, the heterogeneity of the country is likely to return. Um, thank you. Um, that seems to be like a good segue to a couple of questions we have in the chat. So specifically about um, 
kind of reviving Stepan Bandera as a national hero? This is one question. And the other question, um, uh, people asking to comment on the narratives of denazification, right? That Putin advances as one of the major goals of that uh, special operation. Anyone wants to go? Yes, go ahead. Ben. How about if I just get us started? Mm -hmm. um, Bandera is also synonymous with anti-Semitism. And that does not seem to be at the forefront of any conversation right now. And of course, we know that the um, Ukrainian Jewish population has been decimated right now after decades of having rebuilt and re-entered, in a sense, Ukrainian society. Uh, so the war has, in a sense, um, I won't say gotten rid of the anti-Semitism issue, but it's not at the forefront of the agenda. And Bandera has, we've been invoking, or people have been invoking Bandera since 2014. And of course, the society is very complex. And I, I just don't see that as being what's going to return. Um, once the war is over, but I could be idealistic. Thank you, Beth. Go ahead, Nathan, and then Jared. So I, I think part of the, the thing to remember here, and this has kind of been touched on, but I'll just say it outright. Um, Ukrainian history is messy and fractured and there's a lot of partialities and a lot of overlap and a lot of contradiction in narratives of Ukrainian history. There are no real good sanitized capital H heroes to look for in Ukrainian history in the 20th century, really, especially when we're talking about like between 1917 and 1940, five. Um, and so part of that too is, is dealing with how do how do Ukrainians handle the historic legacy of Soviet occupation, Nazi occupation, colonization from both the Russian Empire and then from the Nazi regime and then from the Soviet Union and what's happening now? And there's there's a whole lot of differing opinions on how these historical figures and historical events are treated in narratives of what they mean for Ukraine today. And I think the restoration of Stepan Bandera is very interesting because in some instances, in some of the people that I've talked to, he's kind of taken on like a Che Guevara type aspect where they don't really know anything about him, but he looks cool on the t-shirt and it's like a rebel, like, yeah, stick it to the man kind of thing. And then there are other people that are like, diehard Banderites that really espouses, you know, a lot of the negative things that like the, the anti-Semitism and the pogroms that he was involved in and the Nazi collaboration. So again, there, there's this really no overarching narrative of kind of, that we can sort of pick up on as to sort of guide us into where is this going to, to be headed, especially in terms of how are Ukrainians going to deal with their history, you know, ancient, modern, Soviet contemporary, how is all of that being processed? That, that's a huge question, probably the central question for Ukrainians to answer for themselves. And, and like I think uh, Jared mentioned earlier, this war is really coalescing this idea, but it's a, it's a temporal moment, right? This compression of identity, there's a clear aggressor, we're defending our homeland. That moment at some point will pass. And as the, those bounds on, on these processes of, of identity creation and solidification began to relax what is going to fill that, that vacuum. And that's a really tough question to answer now. And I think that it's, it's definitely something to, to be looking out for and keep a watchful eye of. Thank you. Um, Gerard, please, and then Jessica. I'm happy to defer to Jessica. Okay, go ahead. I'm sure you'll have something great to add after Jared. Um, yeah, right? So Putin is saying Ukraine's government is 
neo-Nazi, pro-Nazi, controlled by little Nazis, again, the word little coming into play here, right? Um, I think what we have, and none of this is factually correct on a grand scale. There are certainly neo-Nazis in Ukraine. There are neo-Nazis in Russia. There are neo-Nazis in the United States, right? Let's not forget these things. But what's going on here, one of the things we have to understand is this is as twisted as a plot in a Russian novel, or this is reminiscent of reading between the lines in a Russian or a Soviet novel. We cannot forget that. We can't forget partially again, what Beth mentioned earlier, that some of this language is about the internal Russian hearer, listener, seer of this text, right? So linguistically, we must understand that calling Ukraine's government Nazi, neo-Nazi, little Nazis is part of propaganda. It is part of tr tr tugging at the heartstrings of Russians who remember um, or fought right in World War, in the Great Patriotic War, who were either taught about it right in textbooks after the war, who fought through it, have parents, grandparents, largely grandparents at this point, great grandparents who were in it. Yes. So we have to remember, and then that war, of course, is about Soviet heroism over. German Nazis. So this is tugging on heartstrings linguistically with propaganda in a very twisted way to have Russians stand up against and uh, Ukrainians and believe in this movement by Putin and Putin's Russians against Ukraine in this war. That's There's some good pieces about this in, the, in news. There's a New York Times piece. There's a Washington Post piece that break this down for you. This is crucial to understand. Um, I recommend you all go take a Russian literature course to understand the twists and turns of the novels. Jaren? John has his hand up. Okay. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, and to, to kind of just expand on that very briefly, you know, going back to um, Professor Toll's uh, slide with the Crimea referendum of, you know, choosing Nazis are choosing Russia, essentially. Um, you know, this also harkens back to um, 2014 and the Euromaidan um, and Russian um, narratives, propaganda of the language of a uh, fascist coup or a fascist uh, junta um, taking control in Ukraine. And of course, um, uh, the, um, the fleeing of uh, President Yanukovych uh, as well. So that's kind of another aspect that you know, laid, feeds into some of the groundwork of what we're seeing uh, today. Yes, um, Gerard, did you want to add something? Good. Very briefly, it's, it's a Soviet storyline. You know, it's, a, it's the storyline from the Soviet Union and its vision of Western Europe, Western Germany, uh, you know, so in articulating this storyline, uh, Putin is revealing his deep socialization uh, into the by the Soviet state and uh, revealing himself as a Soviet man uh, in in a, in a major way. And you know, it is one that is um, it's the only story. Uh, and it's a sort of communist story. I, I recognize it from uh, the research I did on the Bosnian uh, war and the rhetoric of Milosevic uh, in, re in relation to Croatia and Tudjman and uh, Croatian nationalism. Uh, so uh, this is something that is a legacy of communism. Uh, it is weaponized as many people have pointed out uh, and it is, it's got this hyper real quality to it because, you know, you, you de try to denazify a state that has a Jewish president. I mean, uh, so there's a lot of other things going on. Uh, and, you know, the, and then Ukrainians are running off the same script, right? They are replaying the great hat patriotic uh, war too. And Timothy Schneider is one who has sort of flipped this and say, Russia is the fascist uh, state. Uh, and the particular tropes that Putin uses about purifying the nation, getting rid of the scum uh, and, and the like, uh, not recognizing that Ukraine exists. Those, those particular tropes of, uh, are a clear fascist rhetoric. 
Yes, um, thank you so much. And I just want to add that all these right-wing nationalist um, groups in the Ukraine have not been elected to any uh, significant government bodies. So to talk about the state of Ukraine as being Nazi state is uh, absolutely counterfactual. So, and another thing is that in Russia today, there is total information control over media, all media which were at least somehow oppositional, they are practically closed. And people can go to jail for 15 years. This is like the law recently enacted for calling this spatial operation the war. So that means that a lot of Russians actually don't think that there is a large war going on. They think that there is this kind of um, uh, operation that Putin is doing to get rid of Nazis in uh, Ukraine, to free Ukrainians. So, and, and that is something, as Jessica said, rings with um, Russian uh, people's feelings about denazification. So it's um, complicated. Peter, do you, want, do you have a few minutes left? Do you want to ask um, questions about um, Putin's popularity? Um, uh, that war? I mean, it's hard, again, it's hard to, that's just kind of speculation. How about we ask uh, Tim Lewis's question? What strains will these massive refugee flows have on the surrounding mm -hmm. countries such as Poland, Romania, Moldova? Mm -hmm. I can get us started again. Name. <clears throat> name it, school, health, housing, um, all the way around neighboring countries into Germany where a lot of people have already landed. Um, so the strains in the rest of Europe are going to be tremendous. Estimates now 3 million refugees. So that's refugees that's crossed an international border. That's not over. There are going to be many more people coming. And we hear in Warsaw that the city, the mayor says we're almost about to collapse. So name the infrastructure, uh, transportation, all of those in infrastructures, particularly related to moving people from place to place. And then secondly, when people remain in place, everything is under strain. Um, I also want to mention, I put into um, the Q&A a few local Ukrainian NGOs that started due to the 2014 um, war invasion and are still operating and providing humanitarian aid. Um, so that's in the, in the q and I bet I don't see that, is it? If you click on the answered questions, oh, um, answered. Okay. it's under it's under Ruth's question. Perfect. Oh, okay. uh, and this is kind of on the other side of the, of, of uh, Tim's question. We also have to start thinking about uh, what Putin's doing, obviously, with blocking hum the humanitarian corridors and the the, new, the news of thousands of uh, Ukrainians being forcibly evacuated into Russian uh, controlled areas and into Russia itself and you know, what the future holds for them as hostages and, 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 and that's a particular, a particular concern. Um, and then in terms of the refugees, uh, Moldova, the poorest country in, in Europe has, a, you know, a huge uh, amount of um, uh, refugees they're, they're um, hosting. And, you know, from what I've read, they're at, they're basically at their breaking point in terms of what they can do. So this is really, uh, as this uh, drags on, this is really gonna, uh, uh, only get worse because if somehow it stops tomorrow, so much infrastructure, so much housing has been destroyed, where are these displaced people gonna go to? So it's it's a regional issue, right? Throughout Eastern Europe and into other parts of Europe. Um, it's not enough, but I, I hope everyone's seen the news that Biden has um, uh, uh, allocated 100,000 spots to Ukrainian refugees in the United States. We don't know how quickly that will take effect, certainly. But one of the things I'd like all of us to think about is how, particularly those of us with Russian and or Ukrainian backgrounds, is how we might get involved with that in our relatively local communities. 
I'm fortunate in upstate New York to be near a city that resettles refugees, several cities that resettle refugees on a regular basis. And I will be keeping my eyes out in ways I can help here. Um, some people are able and fortunate enough to be able to go to assist um, in the region in Eastern Europe for refugees on the ground, but there's lots to do in other ways as well, in, in addition to donations. Okay, does anyone have um, some other comment? Because I'm just conscious of time and we are um, coming to the close of um, this um, amazing conversation. Anyone would like to add anything? No, we are good. Okay, I also would like, oh, go ahead, Jared. Yeah, so um, what I would, would like to say is that um, this is a war uh, waged by regime, not by a people. Uh, and so therefore, we sh some of the ways in which Russian culture has been demonized as a consequence of this war, I think, uh, are counterproductive and unwarranted. And the targeting of uh, Russians, um, you know, there are Russians that are trying to flee the country. We, we should be open to uh, those uh, Russians that are uh, in very difficult circumstances too. Um, so I, I think that we um, help the regime's narrative by making it Russia versus Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much, Gerard. I think that is a very powerful ending to this conversation. And um, I would like to um, thank all panelists um, for being um, here with us. Uh, also thank the audience um, and ask like for asking all these questions and staying with us um, for that long. Um, and let's hope that um, this kind of violence is gonna stop because as I was trying to say, it affects so many people in this world, right? And um, we clearly can see how damaging it is to our future as humanity. So thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.